And uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give a talk. And uh, especially a big thank you to all of my co-authors, uh, all, all of whom contributed to this, and I couldn't have done it without their help. So I have, I'm unconflicted. I have no conflict of interest. <clears throat> so first, let's start off by talking about what is that fancy word phylodynamics and what does it actually mean? So phylodynamics is the study of how epidemiological and immuno immunological processes act to shape viral phylogenies. And it's sort of a complementary approach to epidemiological approaches. And importantly, it's, it's done using only the sequence data, often a secondary use of the sequence data that was sequenced for clinical reasons or, or other reasons. And when it's combined with clinical and demographic attributes, it can yield interesting insights into epidemic dynamics that are actually hard to do um, otherwise. So let's start off with what is a virus phylogeny. It's essentially, it's a family tree of a set of virus sequences. And you can make the branch lengths of these trees proportional to time. And that allows you to make time-structured inferences about epidemic dynamics. So you can use things like the distribution of where nodes are in time, or branching points are in time, and the distribution of the lengths of the branches in time to draw inferences about, for instance, how far back in time epidemics began. So treatment prevents HIV transmission. Um, and we know that antiretroviral treatment reduces individuals' plasma loads, plasma viral loads to undetectable levels. It reduces HIV-related morbidity and mortality, and very importantly, it reduces the risk of HIV transmission. And indeed, we've heard a lot at this very conference, uh, we've heard strong evidence that treatment, especially early treatment, is very beneficial. However, quantifying treatment success at preventing transmission remains a significant challenge. And so scientists like us, we like to think of different ways of quantifying that. And so we got to thinking, can we use methods of analyzing viral sequence data to make inferences about how effective treatment is at preventing the transmission of HIV? So this would be a different independent way of doing it relative to epidemiological approaches. So one such phylodynamic or phylogenetic method that might be applicable here is the use of diversification rates, which are essentially, it's the rate at which branches split in a phylogenetic tree relative to time. And so in a virus phylogeny, diversification rate roughly approximates the transmission rate because the evolution of the virus takes place on a similar time scale as transmission. And we can uniquely assign an integrated diversification rate of a lineage to each tip in a tree. And that can allow us to test the hypothesis that treated HIV lineages should display lower diversification or transmission rates relative to untreated HIV lineages. And to do this, we focused on the very well sampled British Columbia epidemic and we obtained sequences from the uh, drug treatment program at the BC Center for Excellence, uh, 20, almost 30,000 sequences from se se almost 8,000 patients, and these sequences are annotated with a lot of different attributes that we can use. But importantly, sampling time, the date that people started taking therapy, and gender and age and, uh, and other attributes like that. So we first removed cases of transmitted drug resistance, which we defined as the presence of resistance mutations in their pre-therapy sample. So we censored that out of the data set. Uh, we defined treatment experience lineages as they're defined as sequences collected after the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. And inexper treatment inexperienced were defined as sequences collected before the in initiation of antiretroviral therapy. And they're distributed in um, according to different risk factors. So there's 
roughly 2,000 MSMs, just over 2,000 IDUs, almost 500 heterosexuals, and a few blood product transmissions. So we first generated a distribution of uh, 1,000 phylogenetic trees using approximate, approximate maximum likelihood. That's just an example tree. And then for each of those trees, we calculated lineage-specific diversification rates for each lineage in the tree. And we then calculated the mean rate for each lineage and mapped that associated rate onto a particular tree. Uh, and we compared treated lineages to untreated lineages. So this is what it looks like once you've mapped the diversification rate onto the tree. And so uh, bluer colors are colder or slower diversification rates and, and warmer or sort of more orangey red colors are much faster diversification rates. And you can see that the branching pattern sort of broadly corresponds with that. And so if we do the comparison with, the, with treatment, this is what we find. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide, but it's this, this result is replicated across all patients, across all different treatment types, and all different kinds of patients. So it's not subject to the kinds of biases that have been historically leveled against treatment, such as that it's a, an artifact of penetration into, uh, of harm reduction into, say, a particular risk group. Oops. Lesson number one, don't lean on the computer. So in every case, the, the red represents un, the untreated lineages. So for all patients, you can see that uh, the mean transmission rate or diversification rate, rate is, much, is far significantly lower in treated lineages, regardless of whether you're summing it across all patients, breaking it down by particular uh, risk groups, there's always a significant benefit to being on treatment in terms of preventing transmission. Now it says I've been talking for 39 seconds. <laughs> um, okay, so in conclusion, um, this measure is derived directly from secondary analysis of sequence data. It provides independent confirmation that treatment significantly reduces HIV transmission, regardless of patient type or kind of therapy taken. It's a lineage rather than a group level measure, so it's, it's, uh, it's not because of a particular aggregation of a particular group and it's replicated across risk exposure categories. And lots of people to thank, uh, especially the BC Center for Excellence and funding sources, and everyone in the BC Center for Excellence Molecular Lab. And I'll take any questions.